Love is a journey two people take together. A journey of discovery. She was a college student, a very, very smart girl with a bright future ahead of her. He had aspirations to be a rapper, and he was good at it. They began dating. They became inseparable. And when you're ready to ride or die, you have to be ready to go wherever the journey takes you. She had two different lives she was living. Who are you with? I don't even want to say no name. She was clearly a ride or die for him. She wanted to protect him at all costs. Because sometimes the dying is real. He is deceased in the passenger side of his friend's vehicle. And sometimes what you find at the end of the journey isn't a life together, but a life sentence. She was like, basically, if I did know, I wouldn't tell you. She had this level of loyalty for him. But she did what she had to do to help her man. June 30th, 2012. It's a humid weekend in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Baton Rouge, as I knew it growing up, was a very lovely place full of culture, very family oriented. But in the years since Hurricane Katrina, the city has changed. After Katrina, when we had a lot of people moving from New Orleans and other areas into Baton Rouge, you had the rivals and you had the turf wars and that kind of thing. So the city started getting more violent. Like most cities, you have the fear of walking alone or driving at night now because of the crime. At 2 a.m. on this balmy Saturday morning, fear becomes reality. 911 is flooded with calls to the Baton Rouge Police Department. We received a call that there had been a shooting. When police arrive at the scene, they find a car sitting at a stoplight. There was shattered glass all over the concrete, and people were screaming. They discover that there were two victims that were injured. The driver of the car, Andre Miles, has a bullet wound in his foot. They were sitting at the traffic light, and his foot was on the brake. And one of those shots that was fired into the vehicle actually hit him in the foot. Andre tells the police that the shots were fired through the window at the passenger in the car, Jordan Key. He's worried about his friend Jordan, who's also been shot. Officers take Jordan's vitals, and they find that Jordan is deceased. Our focus is now, who is this individual? We have to find out who is he so that we can start putting the pieces together. Growing up, Jordan Key had always been the boy that everyone liked. Jordan was a very loving child. He came from a family that was full of love, a joyous family. He was such a hilarious kid. He loved to play jokes. Jordan was very, very talented in more than one way. He can draw. He was also an amazing dancer. When his family moved from California to Louisiana, the talented jokester quickly made new friends. Jordan and Andre met in high school, and they became friends instantly. They hung out a lot, and they were really like brothers more so than best friends. Around that same time, Jordan also found his true ambition. In high school, Jordan and Andre were both connected to the local hip hop scene in Baton Rouge, and they were very well known. I always wanted him to sing in the church choir because he had the talent, he had the gift, and he had the voice. But being a young man, he chose to do rap. After high school, Jordan joined a local rap group and he started recording as often as he could. Jordan also wanted to further his education. We were making plans of him entering into a community college. 
With Jordan planning to go to college as well as his music career, he really had a bright future ahead of him. But now, Jordan's promising future will never come to fruition. Jordan Key, the deceased, had suffered a fatal gunshot wound to the head area. When the devastating news reaches Jordan's family, they're heartbroken. The morning I found out that Jordan had been murdered, I wasn't feeling really well on that day. And my dad called me. And he said, well, there's been an incident. Jordan and Andre were shot last night, and Jordan didn't make it. I felt as if the world had just completely stopped. My daughter, Gina, called, and they always expect me to be the more calm one. But it wasn't a pleasant moment. It was a lot of crying. Meanwhile, homicide detectives arrive on the scene and make contact with their surviving victim, Andre Miles. Andre explains that after going to a party, he and Jordan were on their way home when they stopped at an intersection. The two victims were sitting in the vehicle at a red light, just listening to music and talking. And all of a sudden, shots ring out. He felt this pain in his foot, and Jordan is not responding to him. And it was at that time he looked to his right and realized that Jordan was injured. He says that he didn't get a good look at the gunman because the gunman came up from behind them on the passenger side of the car. It isn't too much to go on. But as EMTs prepare to transport Andre to the hospital, the police find another witness. James Logan was a security guard who was just getting off of his shift, and he says that he was at the light and saw everything. James happened to notice a black male get out of the passenger side of the vehicle that was behind him. James described the gunman as a black male wearing a white T-shirt and dark shorts. While he's watching the guy, the guy walks over to the car and then pulls out a gun and fires three shots into the car. As a security guard, James was armed. He told police that he got out of the car, drew his weapon, and told the man to drop the gun. His bravery, there's not enough words to describe it. He didn't even think about it. Honestly, he thought like a first responder. James says that the gunman jumped into a black sedan as it sped away. He says the driver was also a black male. As the vehicle sped away, James got the license plate number. Investigators put out an all-points bulletin with the license plate number that James Logan provided. The bulletin immediately pays off. Right away, they get a hit. A patrol officer spots the car. That officer immediately puts on his lights. This officer is in full-on pursuit of the alleged murder suspect. On June 30th, 2012, Baton Rouge police are in hot pursuit of the suspects responsible for the fatal shooting of 18-year-old Jordan Key. The suspects attempted to flee the area, but the area that they tried to flee ended up being a dead end. They bailed from the vehicle, and they fled on foot. The officer chases them through the woods, but they manage to escape. After detectives receive word of what's transpired, they swiftly arrive at the location. Now police have a second crime scene to analyze, and that's the getaway car. Inside the car, investigators find what they believe is the murder weapon. There was a handgun on the back floorboard. The gun appears to be jammed. This might explain why the suspects never fired any more shots at the witness or police who were chasing them. 
Police hope that the vehicle's license plate is the key to tracking down the suspects. We're running license plates and VIN numbers to find out who is this vehicle registered to. The car is registered to a woman named Sienna Washington. We knew that it was a female. We also knew from our witness that the individuals that were in the vehicle were definitely all males. Was the car stolen? Or is there a connection between the suspects and the woman registered as the owner? Investigators head to the address found on Sienna's vehicle registration, hoping to find the two perps there. When detectives arrive at the address, they're met by a man who identifies himself as Sienna's boyfriend, Frederick Gaines. Frederick told the detectives that Sienna was not at home. She was at work. Something immediately stands out to detectives about Frederick. Frederick is a match for one of the suspects seen fleeing from the vehicle. We start inquiring about his girlfriend's vehicle. He informs us that she had been robbed. He said the car was stolen in a recent carjacking. Detectives are highly suspicious of Frederick. They ask him to come back to the station for a formal interview. Detectives begin by asking Frederick for more details about the carjacking. Frederick insists he doesn't know anything about Jordan Key's murder. He denied any involvement. He denied just everything. Frederick isn't willing to budge. And even though they believe he's one of the assailants, they don't have enough evidence on him to make an arrest. Detectives soon get a call that sends the case spiraling in a new direction. He said he knew the individual that did the shooting. He said, you need to talk to Chatley Chesterfield and his girlfriend, Essence Dyson. I don't hope this happened to any family, but it does every day in Baton Rouge. And I know it's happening in other places. And every time I see this, it does something to me because they're so young. The kids that's dying young and the ones that's doing it is young. There's no more old fashioned fist fights, you know, high five me, we're good, bye. It's, it's the gun thing. And it's, it's really sad that we've come to this. In 2012, detectives in Baton Rouge are investigating the murder of 18 year old Jordan Key who was gunned down at point-blank range while stopped at a red light. Police believe that a man named Frederick Gaines may be one of the assailants, but they need to gather more evidence before they can say for sure. That afternoon, detectives receive a mysterious phone call that points them in a new direction. According to the informant, the people responsible our local rapper, Chad Lee Chesterfield, who goes by the name Chad the Youngin, and his girlfriend, 19-year-old Essence Dyson. The informant says that's all that he can tell them at this time and hangs up. With just the names to go on, investigators start by checking their database. When they do a background check on Chad Lee, they realize that he has been arrested before and has a few priors. The arrests weren't for anything serious. In fact, they were classified as juvenile because he was only 17. 19-year-old Essence Dyson has also had some run-ins with the law. She did have a criminal record. It was kind of minor. There was a simple robbery, a simple battery on her record. We wouldn't describe her as a hardened criminal. Essence had a real good family. 
They gave her a lot of support. She was adored by her mother and father. She was a college student at LSU, a math major, a very, very smart girl with a bright future ahead of her. But Essence was no ordinary college student. During the day, she was a student, and then during the night, she was, you know, she, she had two different lives she was living. Essence Dyson loved the hip-hop lifestyle, the thriving music scene in Baton Rouge. She was very, very closely affiliated with a lot of these little rap groups that were feuding with each other. And that's how she met Chatley, Chad the Youngin, Chesterfield. He had aspirations to be a rapper, and he was good at it. At 17, he was already on his way. Chad was a part of the Kane Music Mafia, a local rap group in Baton Rouge. Essence met Chad at a party for prominent Baton Rouge rapper Mr. Kane. And they had the same friends, and they hung around each other. In Essence, would go to Chad's concerts, and her friends and his friends, they all would hang out. They began dating. They became inseparable. The two were always together. Was the murder of Jordan Key another incident in the violent feuds of the Baton Rouge music scene? Jordan was an aspiring rapper. Baton Rouge police were already investigating multiple incidences between the city's rappers. There were multiple task force trying to get a hold of all this, and so these different groups were being identified, members of the groups. We just noticed that so many of them had a common name that was affiliated with them. I mean, that name was Essence Dice. If Jordan was having a beef with Chad Lee Chesterfield, it would give him a reason for Chad's girlfriend, Essence, to be involved. Investigators wanted to question both of them. Detectives follow back up with the surviving victim, Andre Miles, to see if he knows them. Andre says that he's known both Essence and Chatley for years. He actually went to school with Essence, and he knows Chatley from the neighborhood. In fact, Andre now recalls that he saw Essence not long before the shooting. Andre had been working as security at a party and he was waiting for the person who was supposed to pay him to come and bring the money. There was this big parking lot where people would hang out after the clubs had closed. So Andre and Jordan were waiting there for the guy that was supposed to pay Andre. Around 2 a.m., Andre and Jordan went into the store for a few minutes. They went in and, you know, used the restroom. But when they came out, they actually saw Essence. Essence was standing there. And of course, they stopped and had a conversation with her because they knew her. Andre says they talked outside the store for a couple of minutes. They stopped and they talked, just, you know, friendly. What are y'all getting into? What are you doing after this? They asked her if she needed a ride. She said no. She was waiting on her sister to come out of the store. Andre said that the interaction felt strange, like something was off with her. After retrieving Andre's payment, the friends parted ways. Andre said that they told Essence goodbye and left the parking lot. Minutes later, the shooting occurred. To detectives, the timing certainly seems suspicious. Their number one priority is now tracking down Chatley Chesterfield and Essence Dyson. Later that day, detectives received word that although Chatley is nowhere to be found, police have located Essence. We transported her to our office. Will she be the key to finally unraveling this case? She just had this very negative demeanor. She was clearly a ride or die for Chatley. She wanted to protect him at all costs. 18th, 2012. Baton Rouge detectives are sitting down with 19-year-old college student Essence Dyson regarding her possible involvement in the shooting death of Jordan Key. A phone tip had pointed police toward Essence and her boyfriend, Chatley Chad Chesterfield. And Andre Miles, who was with Jordan when he was killed, 
told the investigators that he talked to Essence in the parking lot only a few minutes before the murder. Getting any useful information out of Essence will be easier said than done. She just had this very negative demeanor. Basically, if I did know, I wouldn't tell you. Oh, okay. Who are you with? I don't, I don't want to say their name, because I don't know if they want to be involved with the police. So I don't, I don't even want to say no name. Detectives continue to press Essence, and she finally starts to open up. She admits that she knows Jordan Key and Andre Miles, and that she saw them that night at the store. There was nothing nefarious about it. It was just a chance meeting. Essence says it was soon after they left that she caught up with Jordan and Andre at a stoplight. I was right behind that car, but I didn't see nobody walk up to the car because we was at the red light, and I was on my phone. You know, you ain't supposed to. And I just heard gunshots. I look up. What was the description of the guy that you saw? He was like a little taller than me. What color shirt were you wearing? Mm, white. And one thing she's sure of is that it wasn't Chadley. And you're familiar with what the shooter would look like if it was somebody that you knew. Yes. It wasn't nobody that you knew. It wasn't. Essence said that she never saw her boyfriend, Chadley Chesterfield, that night. As far as she knew, he was at home the whole time. Detectives ask Essence where Chatley is now. And that's when she completely clams up. And we kept pressing and pressing and pressing, trying to get information. Then finally, she was just like, I don't have anything else to say without a lawyer present. You're digging yourself into a hole that you're not going to be able to get yourself out of. So that's your statement? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think you're making a terrible mistake. I think you're going to regret this. Can I just go home? Until they can strengthen their theory that she and Chatley are behind this crime, they must let her go. Now that they have a statement from Essence, tracking down Chatley becomes the focus of the investigation. We have officers out, and everyone tells us that he's not there. It was an elaborate plot by all of Chad's supporters to hide him. They even named it Run Chad Run. It was just everywhere on social media. To think of the amount of people that actually participated in the Run Chad Run movement was disgusting. The search for Chad eventually expands outside Baton Rouge. The Baton Rouge Police Department enlisted the help of different law enforcement agencies. We had the US Marshals involved, state police involved. It takes over three months, but the effort finally pays off. They find him hiding out in Baker, Louisiana, which is just about 10 miles outside of Baton Rouge. When they question Chatley, the investigators get straight to the point. Were you involved in that shoot? No, no. Do you know anything about you? He denied being present. He denied everything. Who put I you up to do it? Okay, who did it? I don't know. So what you running for? Cut. I, if I turn myself in, I ain't trying to go to I ain't trying to go to he started off saying that he didn't know anything about the shooting, wasn't at the intersection. Then he changed it to say he had a friend there who looked like him, and maybe that's why they thought it was him. The detectives keep pushing, and Chad's story changes again. Tell me what happened. Well, I was in the car with I don't know if y'all know right now. I was in the car with I just seen somebody walk up and start shooting. I ain't gonna lie, I wasn't trying to see who it was because I was dirty. Chatley claims that after they heard the gunshots, he and Essence took off. Chatley said they never contacted the police because they did not want to get involved. So that's a statement that you want to give? I do that statement. 
Chatley's version of events is entirely different from what Essence Dyson has told investigators. Essence never mentioned him being with her that night, but Chad won't budge on his story. In fact, Chatley downplays his relationship with Essence. Are you and her tight then? Oh, man, Essence? I've been knowing her, but we ain't close like, like that, like that, like that. Y'all not or y'all? Yeah, we, we just, we just, we just talked to each other because we've been knowing each other. Getting nowhere with Chatley Chesterfield, detectives decide to circle back to Frederick Gaines, who they still believe was the likely getaway driver in the crime. Perhaps now that they have Essence and Chatley in their crosshairs, they could use that to get Frederick to flee. And detectives are in luck. He feels the walls are closing in on him, and he's ready to tell it off. Frederick was just following orders. In July of 2012, Baton Rouge police believe Chatley Chesterfield and Essence Dyson are behind the murder of 18-year-old Jordan Key. But with both suspects giving very different accounts of what happened that night, they're hoping the possible getaway driver, Frederick Gaines, can help them clear things up. They want to speak to him again to see if he will flip on the other two. If you willing to take the charge of pulling that trigger, that's on you. I know you didn't do it, but that's fine. That's totally up to you. It's totally up to you. The threat of ending up back behind bars causes Frederick to cave. He kind of felt like, OK, well, they got me now. And he decided that I'm going to come clean and make this right and just take responsibility for my actions. You're going to break it down right now? Frederick admits that he was driving the getaway car that night, but claims he had no idea what was going to happen after he agreed to give his pal, Chatley Chesterfield, a ride home from the club. He wasn't aware of what he was about to get himself into. Frederick says that Chatley was constantly on the phone during the car ride. Chad was talking on the phone, and he had the phone on speaker. He was talking to Essence Dyson. That's one of the chiefs with Chad was, I guess, messing with at the time. So you recognized Essence's voice? Yeah, I recognized her voice. And Frederick could also hear what they were talking about. He said that Essence had been following Jordan Key that night for Chatley while he was doing his show at the club. Essence told Chad that she'd spotted Jordan and his friend Andre outside a local convenience store. I told to Chad about telling him, you know, what they right here right now. Chad, I'm going to keep an eye on him. Stay close to him until we get there. Because we already in the car away, so now when I hear this, though, I'm, I'm like, I'm asking them, like, well, what did they do? What's going on? And, you know, we got into a room a few months back or something. We just catching up to them. According to Frederick, Essence kept Chad continuously informed of Jordan's whereabouts. I see them. They're over here, kind of giving a play-by-play. -play. When Jordan and Andre left, Essence followed them in her view. She continued to keep Chatley updated on where they were going. Frederick and Chatley caught up with Jordan at a red light. They pulled up to the light, and he saw Essence clear as day in the car right behind Jordan Key. He's like, well, that's the dude's right there in that first car. And that's Essence or whoever else in the car behind him was following him. And I'm like, so what you about to do? And he's like, we're about to see you. Before I know it, he just turned out my car. Chatley went over to Jordan's side and opened fire. 
As Frederick sat frozen in shock, Chatley ran back to the car and jumped in the passenger seat. Once he got in, he was like, man, go, go. He was like, man, you better get us away, man. You can't get caught out here like this. I just, you know, just made sure I got away. But the two men didn't make it far. He tried to outrun the police, but ended up taking a turn onto a dead end road. So they abandoned the car and fled on foot. After they bailed out of the car, he and Chatley split up. He made his way back to his girlfriend's house to lay low. Frederick claims he was afraid to tell the police what happened in his initial interview. I just seen you kill a lot. Frederick said that he saw what Chatley did to Jordan firsthand, and he was afraid that if he didn't keep quiet, he would be next. Frederick also says he's since learned why Chad wanted Jordan Key dead. They had a disagreement and a problem that stemmed from some rap songs. Both Jordan and Chatley were very talented local artists. Chatley was a part of Mr. Kane's Kane Music Mafia. Jordan was a part of a different group. And their beef started really over rap lyrics, and it just spun out of control. They did have some type of rift between the two parties because some music had been taken away from the party that Jordan was with. So they were in a disagreement about that. But we didn't think it was anything that was of a major concern, that it would lead to Jordan's death. The motive is the last piece of the puzzle. After speaking with Frederick, detectives finally believe that they have a clear picture of what happened that night. Essence and Chad were both charged with second-degree murder. Police also charge Frederick Gaines with accessory to murder. Since Frederick agreed to cooperate with investigators and testify against Chadley, his charges are eventually dropped. Investigators are hoping the same type of deal works on Essence. She could get her charges reduced if she pled guilty and testified against her man. Their biggest priority at this point is getting a guilty verdict for Chatley, since he was the mastermind and the trigger man. But prosecutors never could have imagined just how dedicated Essence really was to Chatley, Chad the Young in Chesterfield. She felt like Chatley was her ride or die. I think she would have felt that she betrayed Chad. Moving forward, through this journey of losing a child. It's very painful. Every day is not sunshine, roses, happy, but every day is not dark either. There are a lot of dark days, but we do have a time where we can embrace what God gives us, his love, his peace, his joy. And although this is a very, very negative situation, there is always hope in this journey. And I just want to encourage mothers to hang in there and take it one day at a time, one moment, one minute, one second at a time. And we, we will make it. We will make it. Of 2012, police in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, have finally pieced together what happened in the tragic murder of 18 year old aspiring rapper Jordan Key. Investigators believe that a rival rapper, Chatley Chesterfield, who goes by the name of Chad the Youngin, targeted Jordan with the help of his girlfriend, Essence Dyson. Chatley and Jordan apparently had beef over some stolen rap music. With Chad Chesterfield identified as the shooter, the prosecution hopes Essence will agree to testify against him at trial. The district attorney was willing to reduce the charges against Essence in return for information that would guarantee a guilty verdict against Chad, the person that actually pulled the trigger. To everyone's surprise, Essence refuses to make a deal. 
Essence Dyson stuck to her story. She said that she couldn't testify against Chatley because she had no information to give prosecutors. I think she would have felt that she betrayed Chad. So Essence didn't want to testify. She felt like Chatley was her ride or die. She refused to turn against him. In November of 2015, Chatley Chesterfield and Essence Dyson go on trial in East Baton Rouge Parish. The trial was very emotional. The courtroom was full every time we went. Not just with our family and friends, but his friends and family as well. There was a lot of tension between the Chad and Essence friends and family side. However, Essence and Chad aren't bothered by the tense mood in the courtroom. Passing notes and talking and, and giggling and that sort of thing, kind of like kids. I'm not sure if either of them understood the severity of what they were facing at that time. She was smiling like nothing had ever happened. I had to indicate to both of them that they had to be aware that the jury was always paying attention and looking, so they'd have to not be as playful or joyful, because this was a serious case. Their apparent lack of remorse plays into the prosecution's argument. Essence and Chatley were intentionally looking for Jordan Key to murder him in cold blood, and Essence did what she had to do to help her man. Ballistics confirm that the weapon found in the abandoned vehicle match the shell casings of the weapon used at the crime scene. The evidence gathered from the getaway car proved that Chad Chesterfield was one of two men who fled the scene of the shooting. There was DNA evidence on the handles of the car doors, on the murder weapon, and throughout the car. But Essence Dyson was in her own car, and her attorney tells the jury that she had nothing to do with the shooting. Our defense was that this was a chance meeting, and while Essence was present in the area, she didn't have any criminal culpability in any of this. Her lawyers argue that even if she did let Chatley know where Jordan was, she never knew that he was going to kill him. When the case goes to the jury, they side with the prosecution. They find Essence guilty of second degree murder. She was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Chatley is also found guilty of second degree murder. But since he's underage, his sentence is decidedly less harsh than Essence's. Chad, who was 17, could not receive a life sentence without parole. He would be eligible for parole in 30 years. Even though Essence was his accomplice, she could end up doing more time in prison than him simply because of their age differences. While the sentences come as a relief to Jordan Key's family, they bring little comfort. To me, they got what they deserve, but you're not going to ever forget it. It's like, yeah, justice has been served, but what about the families that's left behind to grieve? Not only have I lost my child, but he was robbed of the opportunity to show the world who he was, show the gifts that God had given him that was for the world to see. One thing that I would want people to know about my grandson is that that was greatness on the inside of him, and it was taken away. Essence Dyson will forever live with the consequences of the murder she helped her man commit. I just wish that this could have been avoided. Maybe she could have gotten that degree in math and been working for NASA. A person like her comes from a great background, the type of family she had, the type of future that she would have had. I think it's unfortunate that she had this level of loyalty for him because it ended up costing her her freedom. To the young women, please don't get yourself tied up with these guys that call themselves gangsters. And, you know, this is kind of lifestyle with the fast money and the cars. 
that's not all it is to life. You know, you can do better with your life than that. For some women, love means standing by your man, no matter the cost. And ride or die means you're ready to go wherever your man takes you. But when that ride takes you on a road of no return, you may be asking yourself if the price was really worth it. In Texas, 16-year-old Takesha Gilmer is looking for a place to call home when she falls for an older man who's more than willing to take her in. She looked up to him almost as a father figure. Feeling indebted, she willingly helps her lover in his new lucrative enterprise, only to wind up at the center of one of the most horrendous mass murders the area has ever seen. Let's go! Let's go. I don't think Takesha ever expected that there would be four dead people at the end of that day. She cared for him and loved him. That's what empowered her to do what she did. And later, in Louisiana, finding the perfect man to satisfy her dark desires seemed unlikely for Brandy Holmes, until she bumped into her ideal male equivalent. Robert was kind of her kindred spirit, and they ended up kind of moving really quickly in this love relationship. So when he decides to put his girl to the test, she can't wait to show him what she's made of. This was an opportunity to sort of take it to another level. She was happy, willing, and able to follow him into the pits of hell if it need be. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. Young Takesha Gilmer knows the side streets of Houston, Texas, like the back of her hand, after being kicked out of her mother's home at age 16. Takesha had a pretty tragic upbringing. She was not close to her family at all. She spent a lot of time on the streets wandering. After several months of bunking with various men and several female friends, the quiet drifter is looking for all the free handouts she can get. Takesha is wandering the street, and a man drives up to her and asks her if she wants him to give her a ride. And Takesha took him up on his offer. Takesha had no real love from her parents early in her life. So this is a young woman who was looking for love in all the wrong places, on her own, needed someone to take care of her. As the two chit-chat, Takesha learns his name is Daryl Bellard a 41-year-old Navy veteran who lives in nearby Dickerson. He was really just a sad sack. You know, when you're just looking at his face, there was something off about his eyes. He had been shot during an armed robbery where he was the victim, and this left him with a colostomy bag. Daryl explains that he gets a disability check for his condition, which has left him unable to maintain his house. And although he's only known to Keisha a few minutes, He's hoping she'll be interested in lending a hand. Takesha thought that in exchange for cooking for him, cleaning, running errands and stuff like that, she would just have a roof over her head. He had a car, he had a house, he had money, he had food, and he had all of the security that she was not receiving from her mother. Despite his scruffy appearance, Takesha's tired of living on the streets and jumps at his proposal. She just believed that Daryl was being kind to her out of a sense of goodwill. She looked up to him almost as a father figure. Takesha finally had someone who could take care of her basic, physical, mental, emotional needs. He offered her a home, offered her a safe and warm environment. But it doesn't take long for their arrangement to become a May-December romance. They're in the house together all the time, living day-to-day -day life together. And not only did they begin to get intimate physically, but Takesha really loved him. Whether it was true love or a love born out of the relationship, the caretaking that Daryl gave to her, even just the stability, it's not hard to understand why 
Takesha loved Daryl. But things get more permanent when just a few months later, the teen finds out she's pregnant with her older man's child. Unfortunately, with another mouth to feed on the way and no prospects of finding a job due to her lack of education, Takesha is worried about what will become of their makeshift family. So when an unexpected job opportunity falls in Daryl's lap, he's excited by the chance to make some fast cash. One of Daryl's friends approached him and asked if he was interested in running marijuana, which was something Daryl could do even with this disability. They would run it down through the southern part of the United States and up the eastern coast. Even though she's expecting, Daryl doesn't think twice about asking Takesha to tag along, telling her the payoff will be an easy six figures. And it's an offer she can't refuse. Takesha and Daryl would load up his car. And during these trips, they were transporting 20 to 25 pounds of marijuana. In a lot of ways, Takesha was the perfect cover she was expecting. No one is really going to suspect a man who's traveling with his pregnant significant other of too much. Takesha went along with everything. All along, I believe she understood the magnitude of what she was doing, but I don't think she understood completely how bad this was. Then that fall, the duo takes a short break from their drug runs when 17-year-old Takesha gives birth to a beautiful baby boy. But Daryl isn't thinking about changing diapers. He's already focused on the future. He realized at some point the child was going to grow up and their needs were going to grow, and he needed to make some bigger moves. So he calls in his brother, a fellow dealer in Lanham, Maryland, and quickly gets a lead on something that will set his family up for life. He says he already has plenty of business on his own, but suggests Daryl reach out to his sister-in-law, Dawn Brooks, who has a wealth of connections on the East Coast. Dawn's role, once Daryl arrived with the drugs in Maryland, was to find people to sell it to. Maryland, of course, is a great place for him because he really has no footprint here. Daryl immediately contacts his regular distributor and obtains nearly 60 pounds of pot for his business venture. Daryl wasn't going to be a street-level, dime-bag, $20 a pop dealer. He stands to make $30,000 or $40,000 by unloading this marijuana. Takesha certainly wasn't bargaining for getting involved in some sort of a serious crime. Her real need was to take care of her child and to take care of her man. But the new mom has no idea her decision to tag along will land them both in the middle of a bloodbath. Takesha might not have been prepared to kill on demand, but if he wanted her to, she would not hesitate. In Dickinson, Texas, Takesha Gilmer and her boyfriend, Daryl Beller, are gearing up for a trip to Lanham, Maryland to meet up with his sister-in-law, Dawn Brooks, who says she can help him move nearly 60 pounds of marijuana. She said that she knew people who were interested in buying large quantities and that if he could just get to Maryland with enough, they could sell it and make more money than they'd ever made. Before they go, Daryl packs the drugs into a blue cooler and places it in the back of his vehicle, along with two 45 caliber sidearms he purchased for protection. Takesha has Daryl's back. She knows that he's on the hook for these drugs, and she's going to help him out no matter what it takes. After leaving their son with Daryl's mother on a hot August day, the two make the 1,500-mile trek east. Two days later, the couple arrives and gets a motel room. They then head over to Dawn's apartment with the drugs to set up shop. Dawn was living with her two children, Shayla and Shakur, and her husband in an apartment above a garage at her husband's sister's house. Once the marijuana is broken down, Daryl stores the cooler behind the bathroom door and immediately hits the streets. And Daryl, Takesha, and Dawn went out to sell this bit of marijuana. Dawn directs her brother-in-law to a parking lot where they meet up with a guy who's interested in getting three to four pounds. They made the trade, got the money, everything was going well. Takesha is thrilled to see the product moving so quickly and can't wait to sell the rest so she can get back to her baby boy. 
Takesha loved her baby, but she also loved Daryl. So even though she didn't want to get involved in these drug sales, she had to be by his side. But at the same time, she couldn't wait to get home so that she could hold her baby. But all good things must come to an end. And when they arrive back at Dawn's apartment and speak with her sister-in-law, Mwasiti Sikyala, who was watching Dawn's kids, they learn something's terribly wrong. A woman had said there had been three men that had gone upstairs into the apartment and they had masks and guns, and they had left about five minutes ago. Daryl raced up to the bathroom, and when he opened the bathroom door, he found nothing. His whole plan collapsed, and he was accountable for the drugs, the money they were worth. He was furious. He went crazy. Daryl, at that point, went back downstairs to the SUV, to the black bag with the 245s. He loaded up the guns. He gave one of the guns to Takesha. Daryl angrily points his pistol at the 41-year-old landlord, ordering her, Dawn, and Dawn's two kids into the apartment, while Takesha brings up the rear. He wants some answers, starting with Dawn. He thought that she had actually set him up by creating this large drop so that they would be out of the house and her goons could come in and take the marijuana. You better start answering these questions right now, I promise you. Dawn swears she didn't arrange for the drugs to be stolen and begs him to calm down. Meanwhile, Daryl tells his girlfriend to keep an eye on Wasiti, Shakur, and Shayla. Takesha didn't think that this would go any further but there was plenty at stake here. She needed to keep her family together and therefore was willing to go along with something that Daryl was going to take to another place. Still frantic, Daryl tells Dawn to spill it or things will get ugly. Dawn is not telling Daryl where these drugs are, so then Daryl wants to make sure she understands he's serious and he shoots her in the leg. As the chaos continues, Daryl grows desperate, trying to figure out what to do next. It's gone, man. So he immediately contacts his supplier in Texas to let him know about the missing shipment. I'm trying to figure out now. The supplier tells Daryl, you either find out who has these drugs or make somebody pay. I'm going to take care of it. After obtaining his orders, okay. Daryl hangs up and immediately gives Dawn one last chance to come clean. He started yelling at her and said, tell me where they are. Tell me where the drugs are. Tell me who did it. When she doesn't answer, Daryl grabs a pillow from the couch and presses it against Masiti's stomach, along with the barrel of his gun. When it became apparent to Daryl that the physical pain on Dawn wasn't going to jimmy the information out of her, he tried emotional harm. Without an ounce of remorse, Daryl cocks his gun and fires once into Masiti. She falls in front of a five-year-old boy who's got his three-year-old sister basically wrapped in his arms trying to protect her. Where's the cooler? Dawn is really begging now, not only for her own life, but for the life of her kids, because she just saw Wasiti get murdered. As Dawn looks on, Daryl points his gun squarely at his terrified young niece and nephew and demands for the last time that she tell him where his missing drugs are. She still has no answers, despite the fact that her five- or three-year-old are sitting there and are presumably next. And later, in Shreveport, Louisiana, Brandy Holmes will travel to the ends of the earth for her lover, even when he leads her down a dead-end path. After killing Mwasiti Sakala in Lana, Maryland, while his terrified girlfriend, Takesha Gilmer, stands guard, Daryl Bellard threatens to kill his little niece and nephew, Shakur and Shayla, if his sister-in-law, Dawn Brooks, doesn't tell him where his drugs are. Dawn still has no answers. She still doesn't know who it is. Takesha was scared. She was scared for her life. All Takesha could think about was seeing her own child again. Would she be arrested? Would she go to jail? And her child was the most important thing in her life at this point. Through tears, Dawn begs Daryl to spare the little one's lives. But the crazed gunman has only one thing on his mind, his drugs, and who's going to pay for them. Daryl then shoots Shayla, the baby. No regard for human life, certainly no regard for any familial relation. 
He then swings the barrel towards four-year-old Shakur and pulls the trigger, sending the boy slumping onto fallen Shayla. He got shot right through his heart while he was holding his sister. This was their uncle, and he killed them in cold blood. <laughs> As her children lay dead at the hands of her demented brother-in-law, Dawn can only gasp at the horror before her. That's when Daryl decides enough is enough and finishes off the final victim. Daryl just raised the gun and shot Dawn in the head. He didn't even blink. Traumatized by what she's just seen her boyfriend do, Takesha can barely move. But Daryl quickly demands that she grab her cell phone and snap back into action. Daryl tells Takesha, you take pictures of this so we can show our drug dealer that the drugs were stolen, but we took care of the people who stole them. Takesha followed Daryl's orders because, quite frankly, she had trusted him. But more than anything else, she was in shock. She was numb. And therefore, she just shut down. And so, like a robot, just blindly followed whatever he had to say. Once she's documented the bloody scene, they both frantically pick up whatever bullet casings they can find and use a towel to wipe any areas they touched. So Daryl, at that point, he's in control of the situation, just like he was in control of everything sure, Keisha did. He's got her wiping things down for prints, trying to clear anything up that might be DNA, and get anything else that they need to get out of there. Around midnight, the couple heads to a nearby motel room and showers up. Afterwards, they toss the bag full of evidence in a dumpster behind the building and lie down for a much-needed nap. Takesha went to sleep. When she woke up, Daryl was gone. He had gone back to the apartment. He goes back to continue his cleanup. He wants to make sure there's nothing there. Unfortunately for Daryl, he isn't the only one pulling into the driveway. And when he got there, he ran into Mwasidi's husband. He was looking for Mwasidi and actually asked Daryl had he seen her. And Daryl kind of pushed him off. I dropped him off earlier. Maybe they're in the house. So he went upstairs to check on his family. When he opened the door, he saw a massacre. The traumatized husband immediately calls 911, and within minutes, Prince George's County police are on the scene. Daryl figured, I'll stick around. There's no way they can connect me to this crime. It was at that point that the police started to round up witnesses at the scene. Mosidi's husband and Daryl all ended up back at the police station. When questioned, Daryl admits he and his girlfriend were in town to sell marijuana with Dawn and that it had been stolen, but swears he had nothing to do with the bloodbath. Detectives are certain he knows more than he's letting on, so they treat Daryl as a suspect and keep him under lock and key while they head over to pick up Takesha. They found the room that Daryl had been staying in with Takesha. That room had been abandoned. Takesha had already left. Turns out, when Takesha woke up from her nap and couldn't reach Daryl, who was already in custody, she packed up and ran to the only other person she knows in town, Daryl's brother. Daryl's brother says, you ain't coming here. You ain't staying here. Get out of here. Go down the street, catch the bus, go down to the Greyhound, and get out of here. So that's what she does. She jumps on a bus, and she's headed out to Texas. Fortunately, police have been calling anyone associated with the victims who might have answers and Daryl's brother is on the list. When they speak with him, he immediately tells them where they might find Takesha, and she's nabbed 13 miles away while boarding a bus out of town. The detectives picked her up and said, you're coming to homicide with us. And then she had to have known she was in real trouble. Just 12 hours after the gruesome quadruple murder, Takesha and Daryl are in custody and questioned separately. Under the interrogation lights, they both quickly crumble. So they let her tell lies, and eventually, she just fell apart and told the truth. Takesha had been loyal to Daryl to a fault, but after everything that he put her through, after his horrific actions, she just said that was it, the gloves were off, and she was ready to roll against him. For her role in the crime, Takesha agrees to plead guilty to four counts of first-degree murder and testify against her boyfriend to avoid the death penalty. She's sentenced to life in prison without parole. She has filed a motion to modify her sentence. 
Daryl is convicted of four counts of first-degree murder, one count of conspiracy to commit murder, and four counts of use of a firearm during a felony. He's sentenced to multiple life terms, plus an additional 80 years. Takesha's biggest mistake was probably not just seeing Daryl as a stabilizer, but just allowing him to become her whole world. He helped her find herself in many ways, but she also lost herself following behind him. Behind bars, Takesha deeply regrets not standing up to the man she looked up to as a lover and father figure, and for not trying to save the lives of Dawn, Mwasiti, and Dawn's two children. Even though Takesha was part of this very horrific scene and in some ways participated in it, I really do believe that she was remorseful. But also, at the end of the day, she was an adult and knew what she was doing was wrong. The moment that Takesha went along with Daryl's execution of these four people. She lost the rest of her life with her son. She lost every birthday, every Thanksgiving, every Christmas. She lost any hope she had of making a life for herself. That's what she lost. Takesha Gilmer was willing to do the unthinkable for her boyfriend and a shot at true love. In Louisiana, Brandy Holmes is willing to prove her worth to her criminal lover by showing him that she can be just as bad as he can. 12-year-old Shreveport, Louisiana transplant Brandy has lived her life playing second fiddle to a bottle. Brandy's name came from her mother's favorite alcoholic beverage, which was brandy. Following a nasty divorce, mom's alcohol use doesn't only affect Brandy, but everything around her. She had to be shuffled between mom's house and dad's house, kind of going back and forth between the two, but she spent the majority of her time with her mother. But at an early age, her mom's fondness for the bottle forces Brandy to cope with something she never imagined. The state decides she's no longer fit to be a parent and Brandy learns she's getting a new, unwanted home sweet home. And to her surprise, the state decided to place her in group care under the state's jurisdiction. Children of people who have alcohol and drug issues develop their own psychological issues, their own dysfunctional behaviors. And then to separate from the parents exacerbates the psychological issues, leaving them at times to be very emotionally disturbed. And almost immediately, the troubled young girl lashes out every chance she can. She began to get into fights. She began to use drugs and unfortunately followed in her mother's footsteps and began to drink alcohol. And this was where we started to see this transition turning into criminal behaviors and activities. She was caught entering someone's home, of course, without permission, and she was sent straight to juvie for that. When she's released at 21, Brandy stays with her father and stepmother in Tylertown, Mississippi, until she figures out what to do with her life. Within just a few months, the answer comes unexpectedly when she bumps into 31-year-old Robert Coleman. Robert was this confident, strong, muscular guy who had this kind of intimidating persona, someone that you could kind of feel protected by. Robert Coleman is a criminal. He has a criminal record, primarily for robberies, which are violent crimes. As the two get to know each other, Brandy thinks the self-admitted bad boy might just be the rock she needs in her life, even if the feelings aren't mutual. He saw her as an opportunity just to have fun, where she looked at him as almost a savior or someone who's going to make things better for her. Brandy was very emotional, and she needed a father figure in her life. So even though Robert was 10 years her senior, this was someone who just was the piece of the puzzle that fit right into place. As time passes, the two become inseparable. But when Brandy realizes that her new man requires proof of her devotion, they come up with a game for her to commit the most unspeakable acts, all in the name of love. All she really needed was a positive influence to help her turn her life around. But instead, she got the opposite. 
She probably would have followed him into the pits of hell if it need be. Following a rough childhood, young Brandy Holmes falls hard and fast for ex-con Robert Coleman, one year after she's released from juvenile jail in Tylertown, Mississippi. For the first time in her life, Brandy felt some real stability with Robert. It brought a real warm and fuzzy feeling called love that made her feel really great. And that was something that she needed, that she wanted, that she enjoyed. That winter, after only a couple of months of dating, the pair decides to move in together and relocate to Shreveport, Louisiana, where her mother and now 15-year-old brother are still living. They decided to live with her mother. Well, they kind of figured things out to save up money to get their own place. Apparently, she wasn't that concerned about her mother's alcoholism at that point. OK. Unfortunately, finding a job is easier said than done. Brandy never worked a day in her life. Absolutely no job history at all. Robert, his criminal background and not necessarily having substantial jobs or educational experience either, the chances for them to get legitimate work were really slim to none. With no hopes for the future, Robert decides it's time to resort to what he does best, criminal activity. And he comes up with this brilliant idea to get a gun, that that's going to be the number one thing that they need in order to start getting some sort of an income. Robert suggested that they would stick up homes, nice residential homes. It's the provincial easy money scheme. My dad has Brandy remembered that her father had a 38 caliber gun in his nightstand in his home. So they developed a plan to kind of go down there and see them. That December, the lovebirds spend a night with dad and his wife in Tylerville, steal the gun, and return without them being the wiser. For Brandy to take her father's gun, even though it was going to be used for some sort of a criminal enterprise, she saw it as a victimless crime. And therefore, to do this was just really no big deal for her whatsoever. With gun in hand, Robert's plan starts to take shape. However, they're no longer talking simple robbery. He wants to make sure his girl is up for anything, no matter how sinister. Brandy basically was told by Robert they're going to play the knockout game and to prove her loyalty and love to him. They were going to rob someone, burglarize their home, knock them out, and kill them. And he told her that this would be a way for her to kind of prove her loyalty and her steadfastness in the sense of taking an individual's life without even thinking about it. Surprisingly, Brandy doesn't shy away from the idea one bit. She's excited for the chance to solidify their bond once and for all. Brandy met someone who brought out the worst in her. Robert was making crime seem like it was a lot of fun and therefore was slowly but surely corrupting her mind. The following afternoon, on New Year's Day, Brandy and Robert begin casing middle-class houses. And it doesn't take long to spot the home of 70-year-old retired minister Julian Brandon and his 68-year-old wife Alice in Blanchard, about 10 miles outside of Shreveport. Julian and Alice Brandon were a nice elderly couple. They were just good, fun-loving people. Everybody's friend, everybody's family member, always willing to lend a hand and help those in the community. It's just after 7 o'clock as the Brandons begin to settle in for the night. Just then, there's an unexpected knock on the door. When Reverend Brandon went to open the door, Robert and Brandy were outside the door. Hello? Immediately, within a split of a second, Robert takes the gun, he puts it underneath the Reverend's chin, and he shot him. Instantly, the holy man crumples to the floor as his terrified wife looks on in horror. And they grab her and kind of drag her into the back room, and they demand for all of her valuables, credit cards, money, jewelry, any and everything. And she gives it away without even thinking about it. She's afraid. She knows that this vicious couple probably mean to do her harm. And so she is hoping that begging Brandy to help her, she would survive this vicious attack. 
But before Brandy has a chance to make a moral decision, Robert hands her the gun and says, do it. And there was no stopping her. Robert was just an evil man, and he wanted his woman to be as equally violent. <laughs> After breaking into the Shreveport, Louisiana home of Reverend Julian and Alice Brandon, shooting the man of the house and robbing his shocked widow, Robert Coleman hands the gun to his girlfriend, Brandy Holmes, telling her it's time to prove her moxie. Robert wanted someone who was a puppet, someone he could manipulate and corrupt, and he got that from Brandy, almost to the point where she didn't even care what happened to this elderly couple that they were robbing. Without hesitation, Brandy grabs a nearby pillow, places it over Alice's face, and pulls the trigger. It was clear that Brandy had crossed a certain line that she would not be able to come back from. Just then, as the couple looks on at the massacre in front of them, they hear a groan coming from the main room. It's Reverend Brandon, and it appears he's been resurrected. They thought that he was dead. In fact, he wasn't. And he was trying to hold on to these last seconds of his life. Following the principle that no one is to be left alive, they went to the kitchen, grabbed some knives, and began to stab him ferociously. They actually left a knife lodged in his back. Brandy not only wanted to prove to her man that she could do anything that he threw at her, but she wanted to go beyond his expectations, and she did that through her cold and calculating actions. With the deed done, the loathsome lovebirds head out to enjoy the fruits of their labor. They attempted to use the ATM cards, but were not successful because they did not have the pin codes. So all they could do was sell the jewelry and all the other valuables to local pawn shops to get money. However, as Brandy tries to unload some of Alice's keepsakes, she has a tough time controlling her excitement. Brandy felt almost like an adrenaline rush from killing the Brandons. She now had a badge of honor given to her by the love of her life, which made her feel even better. In fact, she doesn't hesitate to run her mouth to several folks around town. She began to brag about the fact that she had killed Mrs. Brandon and that her and Robert had committed this horrible crime. We've seen this time and time again, killers who can't wait to brag about the horrific things that they've done. This is their red badge of courage, if you will. But she then felt that she could naturally just talk to anybody else about it and get away with that kind of talk. Unfortunately, she's about to face the music when four days later, Folks at the Brandon's church notice there's a key member missing that Sunday. Reverend Brandon didn't show up for his weekly Bible study, and people at the church found that very odd. One friend in particular went with his wife over to the Brandon home and found the front door open. As the pal cautiously makes his way inside, he's met with the shock of his life. It was like a blood massacre walking around there, blood spatters everywhere, gunshot wounds. And seeing Mr. Brandon's body there, he immediately called the police. Within minutes, officers arrive and begin canvassing the home, trying to make sense of what went down. Just then, as they make their way into the rear bedroom, they find Alice Brandon. And miraculously, she's clinging to life. Initially, they thought she was deceased, but then they heard her gurgling, sounds kind of coming out. So against all odds, she was surviving. She was immediately airlifted to a local hospital. Meanwhile, police scour the house for clues, but find no fingerprints anywhere, not even on the knife Robert plunged into the Reverend's back. However, they do tread on something worthwhile. They did find a shoe print and a pool of blood that was close to Mr. Brandon's body. The shoe size was a size nine. It was for a man's boot. As detectives wrap up their sweep of the scene, news crews are encasing the Brandon's home. And it doesn't take long for word of the brutal attack to spread through northern Louisiana, especially when police ask for help. Immediately, it was aired on all these local channels and all the TV, and individuals were made aware of this brutal incident that happened in their community, which was really rare. 
And certainly it made the community uneasy to understand that someone would commit such a horrendous act. Before long, leads start pouring into the Caddo Parish Sheriff's Office. And one tip stands out among the rest, revealing the most twisted and perverse love story the Bayou State has ever heard. They worked so hard not to have anything left on the scene, but that became their undoing. In Shreveport, Louisiana, investigators are searching for whomever robbed and attacked Reverend Brandon and his wife Alice a week ago, killing him and leaving her permanently disabled. And she fought and fought and fought for her life, but unfortunately, she basically was a vegetable at that particular point. This is as worse as worse gets when it comes to a crime. And they were so cocky about this that they just thought they could just act in any way they wanted to without any consequences whatsoever. Fortunately, as the leads come pouring in, investigators get an anonymous tip that Brandy has been running her mouth, taking credit for the brutal attacks. With that anonymous tip, that gave the police a suspect that they could kind of hone in on and go to find out more details. Within hours, went to her mother's home, and Brandy was there. And so it was Robert and Brandy's mother and her younger brother. They were all taken down to the station for additional questioning. Not knowing if one or all of the people in the house are involved, police interview each family member separately, starting with the girl who sparked the tip. When the police asked Brandy about the crime, she led them to believe that she had no idea that there was a crime and that she was completely oblivious to everything that they were talking about. Detectives don't believe her and take note of her cold, calculated persona. However, as the talk continues, they notice a soft side when she discusses her younger brother. So they decide to lay an emotional trap. He said, if we let your mother and your brother go home, will you give us a truthful statement? And Brandy agreed. He was with me. At that particular point, she fell for the bait that they put out, and she started to tell a little bit of the truth, but not everything. It was all my idea. This was the only mushy spot in what seemed to be a very resilient exterior. Once the cops picked up on it, they used it to their advantage. After police determine mom and brother are completely innocent of any wrongdoing, they keep their promise and release them. That's when Brandy admits that she stole her father's handgun while visiting him in Mississippi and claims that she was the shooter of both victims. It was me. She even goes so far as to say she did all the stabbing herself, and Robert wasn't even there. It was all me. I did all of it. I think that Brandy lost her humanity after participating in this horrific crime. The only thing she ever wanted was to do what Robert told her. Even till the bitter end, she was still trying to protect him, even though she lost all semblance of self. Although they don't believe her story, they decide to take it at face value until they hear what her boy toy has to say and his disloyalty quickly comes shining through. Barbara denied any involvement in the crime, so quite the opposite of Brandy, who took all of the responsibility. He denied being there, he denied knowing about it. But detectives have no doubt he's backpedaling. The police noticed blood splatter on his boot, and immediately they confiscated it and took it to the lab. He took such meticulous effort to make sure that no evidence was left behind at the crime scene. But he's walking around in the clothes in which he actually killed the Brandons. Police have enough to hold the pair on suspicion of murder, and they're placed under arrest. And any doubt of their guilt is erased by the tests done on Robert's clothing. The lab work came back with blood matching the Brandons, and the shoe print that was found was a perfect match for that found in the blood pool. Brandy is charged with one count of first-degree murder and one count of attempted first-degree murder. She is convicted on the murder charge, but the attempted murder count is thrown out. Robert is charged and convicted of first-degree murder. They are both given the death penalty. Each appeals their sentence and receives life in prison. 
Robert did appeal his case when it was discovered that one of the jurors was excluded from participating because he was African-American. As a result of that particular error, he was granted a new trial, but the result was still the same. He was found guilty of murder. During her time behind bars, Brandy has never shown remorse for her actions. Given Brandy's very dysfunctional upbringing and the resultant rage that she felt about it, this was a young woman who was a ticking time bomb. She was going to go off at some time. And I believe the detonator was Robert. And this coming together resulted in the serious injury of one person and the death of another. Brandy became a monster for her man. He had tested her toughness, and she'd come through with flying colors, that she was willing to do whatever it takes to be a vicious criminal. Brandy was a killing machine. It was like she was a weapon. I mean, literally, figuratively, in every sense of the word, she would do absolutely anything for her man. And in this particular case, it was clear she would have done anything. To the United States looking for the American dream and thinks she finds it when she meets a successful businessman. This woman came from a tiny little hamlet in Jamaica and wound up making a million dollars a month. But that's nothing compared to the price Jean pays to show she can be just as ruthless as her man. Carl and Jean together was a deadly combination. And later, Rochester, New York single mother Natalie Johnson falls hard for a man with a criminal past. Get out of the car. Jarrell hung around a rough crowd. He was known to be the instigator of the group. And when his need for cash pushes him back to what he knows, he makes sure to take Natalie along with him. They wrapped her up in a carpet, put her in the blue bin, and dumped her in a ravine. Natalie went along with Jarrell to the very end, because at some point along the way, the kindness factor turned into a monster factor as well. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the US. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. Hoping to escape poverty, 24-year-old Jamaican national Jean Brown comes to the United States in search of a better life and a way to provide for her family. She left behind her mother, sister, three children, a son and two daughters. She figures that her life and the life for her children is going to be better if she can make some money. Desperate to provide for her family back home, Jean and her determination land in Miami, Florida, penniless and with no job prospects. When she even came to the U.S. from Jamaica, Jean worked all kind of dead-end jobs. Nothing really came together for her. She struggled a bit. But she finds refuge in Miami's Jamaican community, and the camaraderie only strengthens her resolve. When people are in a surrounding or some sort of a town where they're not a native of that particular place, they find solace in someone who has a similar origin or background. Jean eventually lands a position as a dispatcher for a local trucking company. The job of dispatcher is to keep track of where the trucks are, take orders from customers, and make sure that things are delivered as required. It's a good job. But Jean isn't making anywhere near the money she hopes and has very little to send back to her family in Jamaica. Problem with chasing a dream is that it is just that, a dream. A lot of people are running away from poverty or a bad relationship, looking for new opportunities. But a lot of times, they don't have a coherent plan as to how to achieve the things that they really want, what it is that they really want to achieve. Still, she manages to take advantage of Miami's nightlife. In the early 90s, Miami was the place. I mean, it was fun. There were clubs. It was just an untapped land where anything goes, and people were doing very well for themselves. And it's at one of the clubs where Jean meets fellow Jamaican Carl Smith. 
He's good looking. He takes an interest in her. He's got that thing that attracts people of like minds. Okay, so what do you do for a living? And he's got another thing that Gene finds irresistible, money. He was a drug dealer, marijuana. He was making fistful of cash and that, that was very attractive to her. Jean and Carl become inseparable as she quickly becomes Carl's partner in love and crime. Carl told her about the drug business, told her about his connections uh, in Mexico and how they'd be able to get large volumes of marijuana at low prices. Jean wasn't your typical girlfriend. Jean was looking to make money and make money any way necessary and any way possible. Her ambition combined with her direct line to independent truckers gives birth to an idea for a devious plan. The two decide to combine their resources and start a trucking company as a way to ship large amounts of marijuana from Mexico to the East Coast. Jean was very enthusiastic about that. She saw that as an opportunity to get rich quick. Carl is all for it, but insists they relocate to Baltimore for better distribution to the Northeast Corridor. Carl's contacts would bring the drugs across the border from Mexico. Gene's truckers would pick it up in Arizona and bring it here to Baltimore. And once it arrived in Baltimore, they would sell it. They were able to move product to New York much more quickly. They were able to get into Pittsburgh much more quickly. In addition, Charm City's hunger for illegal substances makes it ripe with opportunity. Baltimore is a city with uh, a major drug problem. There are a lot of drug dealers, a lot of drug users. And so if you're able to get large quantities of marijuana, the dealers figure out who they are and flock to them. Jean is a very headstrong woman. She wanted to be with Carl, and she knew that she would do whatever she had to do by any means necessary in order to be with him. Just a few months later, the business model is underway. They used full-size 18-wheeler trucks that would carry a lot of merchandise, and they'd be able to conceal the marijuana in with the merchandise, and then they could easily conceal the cash on the way back. And within six months, they're making seven figures. This woman came from a tiny little hamlet in Jamaica and wound up making at least a million dollars a month um, she had a, a palatial estate in Florida. She had land in Jamaica, and she ran a pretty well-oiled business. That's the American dream. But for Jean, it's not enough. She also wants to prove to Carl that she belongs by his side. It's already a man's world, but to be a woman and to rise to the top, you had to do stuff that most men would be afraid of. Jean will do everything in her power to keep Carl, to please Carl, and to do anything it takes to achieve success along with him. Even if that means putting one of them in an early grave. This was a driven woman who decided what she was going to do and nobody was going to stand in her way. After joining forces with fellow Jamaican Carl Smith, Jean Brown launches a successful drug operation in Baltimore, Maryland. So things are going well. I mean, from Mexico to Baltimore and all stops in between, money is flowing, drugs are flowing. They're doing about a million dollars worth of business a month. Uh, they're bringing in whatever they want and nobody suspects a thing. And Jean and Carl want to keep it that way. One of the main challenges for drug dealers is what to do with all the money because they're generating tremendous volumes of currency and they can't put it in a bank. And so they need to find ways to transport these large volumes of currency out of the country. A prospect that keeps Jean in regular contact with her family in Jamaica. She sent the money to Jamaica to be laundered. She's given this money to her family and they're investing it in real estate for her. So her kids back in Jamaica are being provided for, her family back in Jamaica is being provided for, and she's living in the lap of luxury. But transporting large bundles of cash out of the country is almost as risky as the drug trade itself. American regulations prohibit people from carrying more than $10,000 unless they declare it. And Jean's goal was to avoid telling authorities either in the United States or in uh, Jamaica. Jean and Carl enlist the help of another Jamaican
associate named Michael Knight. Michael Knight was a money courier. Michael's job was to transport money from Baltimore to Jamaica. Do not let me down. Yes, sir. Gene's instructions to Michael were to carry that money secretly, not to acknowledge to American authorities that he had it, and not to tell anybody in Jamaica that he was bringing it in. For the next several years, all goes well. But running a multi-million dollar drug ring in a male-dominated world takes a heavy hand. Having plenty to prove to her man and herself, Jean quickly takes the lead and shows she's not to be trifled with. Jean had a reputation for being both physically and uh, verbally abusive. And so if people crossed her, uh, she would let them know, sometimes very aggressively. Jean was nobody's plaything. She was not a girlfriend. She was not a piece of fun to be had. She was an equal, at least, and a superior to a bunch. She had to make that known. She did make that known. In Carl, Jean sees someone who's around the same age as she is. He's a risk taker, and he's successful at it, just as she is. When one of their employees disrespects Carl, Jean makes a brutal example of her. There was one incident where she threw boiling hot water on one of her employees that Jean was angry with. The employee was holding her child at the time. Jean and Carl had a lot in common. Both of them had very good business acumen, but she was the hardline boss. He was the guy who ran the day-to-day -day operations and kept all the contacts going. For all things considered, this was a very strong combination, and they were like a dynamic duo, all things considered. But as merciless as Jean may be at work, at home, it's a different story. On the business side, she was ruthless, violent. No one crossed her. When it comes to her family, they loved her. They thought of her as a good support to her partner, Carl. I mean, you're talking about the complete polar opposite to what those in the organization saw. As Jean and Carl's business grows, so does their Baltimore household. They became closer. They loved each other even more to the point Jean had a baby. And now you have this new family, a growing family, a business that is, even though it was illegal, it was highly successful for them. They had at least a solid decade of just smooth sailing. Bada bing, bada boom, money in, drugs out, money in, drugs out, no problem, life's good. And then trouble and purloined paradise. Cash mule Michael Knight is making his monthly trip to Jamaica with suitcases of cash, a trip he has made countless times. But this time, he catches the eye of a vigilant Jamaican customs agent. On this one occasion, Michael was caught and arrested in Jamaica with $565,000 in cash. As the authorities were questioning Michael about this more than half a million dollars he has on him, that's when Michael gave up Gene and Carl. He said this money came from drug sales. Jamaican authorities informed their U.S. counterparts about Gene Brown and Carl Smith's organization. And at that point, authorities decided to start looking into how extensive this drug ring is. At the United States' request, Jamaican officials release Michael Knight as not to raise suspicion with Gene and Carl. He returns to Baltimore and tells his employers the money was seized. But, as instructed by them, he refused to claim it. Gene, who says, you know, cost of doing business, lost half a million dollars, okay. Drug organizations recognize that from time to time, their drugs are going to be intercepted. From time to time, their money's going to be intercepted. Even though the money was missing, Gene had no reason not to trust Michael Knight. After all, Carl trusted him. But more than anything else, this was a hardline boss. I mean, she was ruthless. And so she felt that she had Michael Knight under her thumb. Everyone was afraid of her, including Michael Knight. Why would he lie to her? But almost a year to the day after costing Gene and Carl a half of a million dollars, Michael comes up short again. Jean had entrusted Michael with a million dollars that she wanted him to hold, and he only returned $750,000.
So Gene wanted to find that missing quarter million dollars. When Gene confronts Michael about the missing cash, Michael refuses to tell her what happened to it. If a courier is caught by law enforcement, law enforcement takes the money. That's an explanation that the drug dealers can accept. And so when Michael came up short and had no explanation, that really angered Gene. Carl asks Gene to take care of Michael, and she takes her payback to a gruesome extreme. If Carl wanted something done, Gene made it happen. Carl didn't have to worry about anything. Carl's job was actually easy. Gene was the one who carried out Carl's bidding. So Michael was kidnapped, just swiped off the streets of Baltimore, out of nowhere. It was Gene's enforcers. They take him outside of the city to an area called White Marsh, take him to an apartment there. Carl Smith is there. A couple goons are there. Gene is running this. She has Michael Knight tied up with a phone cord. Gene is interrogating him. Where's my money? Where's my quarter million dollars? And she wasn't getting any answer, any satisfactory answer. That's when Gene's anger turns to uncontrollable rage. She's wailing on him with a cell phone. Her goons were standing by while she beat this man so severely she knocked his eyeball back inside its socket. Gene decides to take the lead on this because Michael has disrespected her and disrespected Carl, and she's not going to let him get away with this. And the carnage is only just beginning. Gene said, if he doesn't tell us where the money is, we'll just have to kill him. Gene orders her henchmen, Peter Blake and Hubert Downer, to take Michael into the bathroom. She said, finish him. And later, in New York State, single mother Natalie Johnson will also look to a new man to be her provider. And like Jean Brown, she'll go from bystander to killer. Jarrell knew the quickest way to make money was to take advantage of a senior, and he knew a senior, and he took advantage of her. She took his orders, no questions asked. In Baltimore, Maryland, Jean Brown is dealing with an employee who she believes stole $250,000 from her and her partner in love and business, Carl Smith. Jean demanded loyalty because this was business. This was the foundation of her relationship with Carl. Despite the brutal beating, Michael Knight still refuses to say where the missing money went. So Peter and Hubert put Michael in the bathtub. and stabbed him repeatedly until he was dead. The human mind can rationalize anything. In this particular case, Jean felt that she wasn't a criminal, she wasn't a killer. She was just protecting her interests, protecting her relationship, and protecting her man. She was at her worst with him, and she was becoming more of a hardened criminal than her partner. With Michael Knight dead, Jean orders her men to get rid of the body no evidence left behind. Over about two days with power saws, they dismember the body. They pack up pieces and dispose of the body around Baltimore County in a number of places. The, the body's never been recovered. Jean and Carl believe they've gotten away with murder. But just in case, they decide to lay low in Miami, Florida. Little do they know, Maryland investigators are already onto them. And a missing persons report filed for Michael Knight only adds fuel to the fire. After about four or five days, his sister wound up calling Baltimore area police to say, I need to file a missing persons report. Nobody can find my brother. The Baltimore police look into it. And it isn't just Baltimore police. In the meantime, federal law enforcement was also looking for Michael Knight because the Gene Brown organization was now on the federal radar. Hoping to put pressure on Jean Brown, investigators track her and Carl down in Florida. And then surprise, surprise, here comes the detectives wanted to know what Jean knew about Michael. The detectives asked Jean, what do you know about Michael Knight? 
What's your connection to him? She denies everything. But at that point, she gets nervous. Gene and Carl realized after the police came down to Florida that the heat was on, uh, and so they left and went to Mexico. But once in Mexico, Gene realizes more than the scenery has changed. Between the Fed looking at them, between detectives back in Maryland looking at them, their relationship goes through a rocky road. There's trouble in their relationship. I called the shots. Carl was done. He was a multimillionaire. What more did he need? I don't work for you, okay? He wasn't happy being with Gene either. He let her know this. Carl's not happy. He starts searching Mexico for love, and he finds it. He takes off and doesn't look back. And Gene said then, oh, no, you don't leave Gene Brown. But it goes beyond a lover's betrayal. Gene worries that if she loses Carl, his Mexican cartel connection goes with him. Jean didn't want to let that happen. Uh, she had a very successful and very lucrative marijuana business, and she wanted to keep it going. So she goes through the Mexican connections. Now, keep in mind, these are the same connections Carl introduced her to not too long ago. Jean saw this as the ultimate betrayal. This is a woman who saw everything as her and Carl, just the ultimate relationship. And now, if he's not with her, well, in her mind, he's against her. And the next day, Carl is mysteriously assassinated on a lone Mexican highway. And uh, what wound up happening is that Carl Smith and his new paramour were in a car, and goons shot Carl Smith dead in front of his girlfriend. She got shot four or five times through the arm, and they left her for dead. She wound up living. Jean Brown made her point. The next day, Jean returns to Miami to run her drug empire, which is now hers and hers alone. But the FBI has been busy while she was away. They connected with her associates, and one by one, they coughed up Jean Brown without hesitation. And by the time Jean gets back to the United States, the feds had the case that they needed against her, not just for the drug ring, but for Michael Knight's murder. She's arrested for numerous drug activities and for the first degree murder of Michael Knight. She went to trial and was convicted of the conspiracy to engage in murder, kidnapping, drug distribution, and racketeering. 15 years after coming to America, Jean Brown is sentenced to life in prison. Well, I think Gene has learned that crime doesn't pay. Ultimately, you're going to get caught. The drug business is a business with no future. At the end of the day, she started with nothing, she ended with nothing. She's probably lamenting, if anything, that the reason for it all is gone. She can't provide for her family in Jamaica. Her children don't have a mother, and everything she worked for has been seized. So. Was it worth it? Probably not. Sometimes two people don't bring the best out of each other, and that was definitely the case with Gene and Carl. Right. Gene Brown's love for her man led to a life lived larger than a mythical movie crime lord. In New York, the lengths to which Natalie Johnson will go to please her man will be on a far different scale yet lead her to the same end. Life starts out on the straight and narrow for Natalie Johnson in a modest rental home in the Great Lakes city of Rochester, New York. Natalie grew up with two parents in the home. She was well taken care of, so she had all the things that she wanted, although they, they weren't very rich. As a teenager, she studies hard. Her parents encouraged her, and they backed her going to college and she started to study uh, nursing, and she earned a certificate in nursing. She gets a good job in a nursing home, but at the age of 22, she hits a snag. She became pregnant. The relationship died, so she remained with her parents. They helped raise the child. 
They assisted her because they believed in her dream. So they did all they could to help her succeed. She worked hard. She was trying to better herself. But life isn't all work and no play for Natalie. Far from it. She enjoys her fair share of relationships. She was pretty sexually active. She wasn't exactly the most attractive girl, but she had her way finding men into her life. Kind of like the attention. But by the age of 26, Natalie is looking for more than sex. She wants love, and she's about to find it, with some deadly strings attached. He knew what he was looking for in terms of being a predator. Natalie fit the bill. When she became involved with him, it just snowballed out of control. In Rochester, New York, 26-year-old single mother Natalie Johnson spends her days working at an assisted living facility and her nights out with friends playing the field. Natalie was kind of a fast girl. She kind of liked the attention. During one such night out, she meets handsome charmer Jarrell Henry. He was the type of person that was very smooth and very dangerous. And I believe that the smooth came before the danger. But while 27-year-old Jarrell Henry is saying all the right things, there's one thing she can't help but notice, a police GPS tracking device. Jarrell had committed a violent carjacking, and he was sent away for 10 years. So uh, an ankle bracelet that GPS was put on him uh, as a condition of his parole. He had a gun. I mean, he used the gun in terms of intimidating the victim into letting him take their car. Despite his record, Natalie finds herself smitten with Jarrell's charm. Jarrell showed her attention, which she was craving for, apparently. She slept with him, and that's the beginning of their relationship. Even though Natalie was ambitious and outgoing, this is a woman who suffered with poor self-esteem. So when a good-looking guy presents himself to her and her friends and chooses her over her girlfriends, well, she's taken by it hook, line, and sinker. Natalie not only falls deeply in love with Jarrell, she also thinks he is the perfect father for her daughter. Natalie was looking for someone to care for her child, and when she met Jarrell, she felt that he could fill those shoes. And less than two weeks after their first night together, Jarrell leaves the home he shares with his grandparents. Jarrell was adopted by his grandparents at the, probably the age of five and lived right there on Hazelwood Terrace, so often with grandparents who take over raising their children's children. When they become young adults, they pretty much run the household. But none of the red flags stop Natalie. She invites him to move in with her, her parents, and her now four-year-old daughter. She was madly in love with him, and the parents thought, well, maybe this is someone for her. You know, a, a lasting relationship. They got along very well uh, with her daughter. They got along extremely well. They had a good rapport. Um, she saw that. She loved it. And she wanted to continue that. But while Jarrell may play the role of father figure, there's one crucial way in which he can't contribute to the household. Jarrell had a terrible time finding a job due to the fact that he had a criminal record. If you have a record, it's very difficult to get hired. So that causes a great deal of frustration. To not be able to get a job, to not be able to make money, and we're talking about the male ego, so those sorts of things are so important. To not have those things, that's got to be emasculating, especially to a young man. Jarrell had nothing to offer Natalie other than the fact of companionship and making her feel good. He was looking for some way to make money, to get money fast. And despite the fact that he's on parole, he turns to the only thing he knows. Instead of getting a job like everyone else does, he just decided that his job was to rob. Natalie really felt like she needed him. So in order to keep him, she would do anything that he asked her to do. Jarrell tells Natalie he has the perfect robbery target in mind his grandparents' next-door neighbor, 73-year-old Edlin Chung. Edline was originally from the big island of Hawaii. She came to Rochester, and um, she became an adjunct professor at RIT. And she, she was there for 20 years. She was involved in 13 different charities. 
Edlin was a, a kind and generous and giving person. But none of this matters to Jarrell, who only sees Edelyn as a ticket to instant money. A couple things made her uh, a good target. Um, one, her age. Number two is that um, the perception is that because she was possibly Asian, that she had cash, large sums of money in the home or available to her. After some minor hesitation, Jarrell convinces Natalie to help him. The dream of a better life is a driving force for Natalie. So even if it means going along with some of the nefarious plans of Jarrell, well, she's willing to do it. One early morning, soon after telling Natalie about his terrible plan, Jarrell decides the day has come to put his plan in motion. He rouses Natalie out of her sleep and asks her to drive him to his old neighborhood. Jarrell went to um, Edline's home with Natalie. He had a basket of fruit to uh, apparently offer her. Under the guise of wanting to introduce his girlfriend to an old neighbor, Jarrell asks Edlin if he and Natalie can come inside. Edline had known Jarrell since he was a little boy. She knew that he was in and out of trouble, so she was a little leery. And that's when he just pushed her back and knocked her over. Jarrell and Natalie bound her up with the duct tape. They duct tape her ankles, duct tape her wrists, and they uh, basically interrogated her relative to what was in the house that they could take, whether it was cash, whether it was jewelry. No, Not getting the answers he wants, Jarrell's desperation skyrockets. And within minutes, things go from bad to worse. Go out of me. In Rochester, New York, Natalie Johnson and her ex-con lover Jarrell Henry, desperate for easy money, decide to rob Jarrell's childhood neighbor. 73-year-old Edlyn Chun. Natalie, Natalie. The fact that she was an older female living by herself, she was very vulnerable. Where's the money? The moment he walks into the house, Natalie knows this isn't the Jarrell she once knew. Natalie, this is a guy who's in charge, who's going to do whatever he has to do, and now she's so scared that she will follow whatever commands he gives. After knocking Edlin down, the pair gets to work implementing their plan. While Jarrell was restraining Edline, he told Natalie to, to search and see what she could find. I think she, she found some jewelry or something like that, but I guess not everything that he wanted or everything that he thought was there. There's someone in this house. Where are they? Natalie is a caretaker, and so she really believes that once Jarrell does what he has to do, then they're just going to leave and everything will be okay. Jarrell went searching, he went uh, everywhere, and he also went up into the attic and apparently found 22 caliber rifle. Adeline's house had been broken into twice, and so a friend of hers gave her a rifle to keep loaded in the house. And of course, there's no way she would have ever lifted that, that rifle to hurt anyone. So she put it up in the attic. In another room, Natalie finds their biggest score, Edlin's checkbook. Jarrell and demanded at gunpoint that she sign checks made out to them so that they could cash them. Edline was very upset. You can imagine how upset she was and how frantic she was. Natalie was trying to calm her down. She was comforting her and saying, oh, everything's going to be OK. At least that's what Natalie hopes, until Edlin mouths off to Jarrell. I'm going to the police. Adeline said something to set him off. She said, the moment I can go to the police, I will. He did what he felt he had to do to silence her. Jarrell shot Edlin twice in the head. One of the shots went through here and went, went, went through here to disfigure her jaw. Jarrell killed this woman in front of Natalie, but she didn't call the police. She uh, probably was thinking, well, if she says anything about this, this is going to put her man behind bars, so she's not going to be with him anymore. So she was totally in concert with him. She couldn't at that point in time say, I'm no longer in, because now she becomes a witness, and she would have to be dealt with in the same way. Natalie sees the man she loves, the man who she feels could be a father to her daughter, actually kill someone. So now, in her mind, in her body, she just goes totally numb. She is frozen with fear, but Jarrell gets to work covering their tracks. They were very careful about making sure that they cleaned up behind themselves, 
They used plastic gloves. They were pretty sure that no one saw them come in and out of her residence. So they were very sure that they, that they had done a good job. He's already got plans for the almost $20,000 in cash from the pre-signed checks. Jarrell calls up two friends. He offers them $10,000 to help them dispose of the body. They wrapped her up in a blanket, and they had put her body into this plastic bin. And eventually what they did was they took the bin to Tryon Park, which is a kind of remote area in Rochester with a lot of ravines. Once there, the gang dumps Edlin's lifeless body like a piece of garbage. And what had happened was that she had come out of the bin. The bin had stopped on a ledge, and her body had ended up down below. After that, they left. Jarrell then paid off his friends with one of those checks. Cash this check immediately. Jarrell and his friends part ways, and he and Natalie return home as if nothing had happened. No one saw anything. Natalie is really stuck between a rock and a hard place. There's nothing that she can do about this right now. Bottom line is, if he goes down, she goes down. And then she loses her dream. She loses her man. She loses her freedom. The next night, Natalie goes to work at the nursing home while Jarrell returns to his old neighborhood and steals Edlin's car. Little do they know that three days after their crime, workers in Tryon Park find Edlin's lifeless body and call the police. She was wearing a sweatshirt that had Rochester Works over the front. So they went to that business and asked um, who might have that sweatshirt. They said there was board members only who were given those sweatshirts. They had a photograph of um, Edlin at the scene of um, where she was dumped, and uh, one of the employees there identified her as Edlin. They were able to determine where she lived based on their information. Looked at the house. They couldn't figure out you know, why in the world would someone kill this RIT professor who was so, so instrumental in helping people in the community. They did notice that her car was missing. So obviously they put out a bulletin to be on the lookout for her car. Jarrell and Natalie think they've covered their tracks, but Jarrell's impulsivity will be their ultimate undoing. He was dead set on committing this crime and totally forgot that he was being tracked every inch of the way. Twenty-six-year-old Natalie Johnson and her boyfriend of two weeks, Jarrell Henry, believe they've gotten away with the murder of 73-year-old Edlin Chun in Rochester, New York. It's amazing to me that someone, after doing such a horrific act of murder, could just go back to their home and pretend nothing happened. After the crime, Natalie felt more attached to Jarrell. Um, after going through this, this heinous crime from the beginning to the end, she felt even closer to him and felt more attached to him because they had done this together. But police are hot on their trail. What they didn't realize was once they dumped her body down this ravine, her body came out the bin and her body was exposed. As the chief of police, I had uh, 15 to 20 people come to my office demanding that we solve this crime due to the fact that they wanted to see justice brought to Edlin. In addition to putting out an APB for Edlin's car, they go door to door, asking if anyone saw or heard anything unusual over the past few days. In doing a neighborhood check, they were able to determine that one of the neighbors was Jarrell. They made the determination that he had just been released from prison and was on parole and had been released to that house at uh, next door. Police decide to check Jarrell's tracking device, something he seemed to forget all about. And the way that they knew that he was involved in this whole thing was that ankle bracelet, that GPS. It tied him to Edline's home. It tied him to Tryon Park. And the same GPS device that is used to tie him to the murder also leads police right to Jarrell's whereabouts the next night. Jarrell was arrested driving Edline's car. He had her cell phone. He had $10,000 in cash. 
and even the 22 caliber rifle. Sir, I was charged with murder one because with depraved indifference to another person's life, he took that life. He doesn't rat out Natalie, and she might have gotten away with murder, except she told a friend about her role, and he goes straight to the police. Days later, she's picked up by authorities and booked. Natalie lost a great love, Jarrell, and she knows that if she goes to jail, she's going to lose her daughter, too. So she's going to say whatever she has to say in order to stay out of jail. Natalie was charged with murder second, uh, which means that she was present when a person not involved in the crime was killed. Facing life in prison, she's offered a plea bargain, a shorter sentence if she testifies against Jarrell Henry. But she rejects it. Natalie would not turn on Jarrell. She would not be a witness against him. She was still standing by her man. But Natalie's insistence to stand by her man only results in her own trial nine months later. Natalie claims she was sleeping the whole time of the crime. The jury doesn't buy her story, and Natalie Johnson is sentenced to 25 years to life. One way that they were able to connect Natalie to the crime was that they found the gloves that were used in the commission of the crime in her car. So they were able to trace it and, uh, and tie her into the whole thing. During sentencing, she was able to, to give a statement. And she said that she was the victim and that her child would be a victim and that she would be away from her daughter. Her daughter would grow up without a mother. But she never said that she was a victim of Jarrell's. In a separate trial, Jarrell Henry is found guilty of murder in the first degree and receives a life sentence. Prior to being involved in this incident, Natalie was somebody who took serious efforts to have a good life, to have a good employment, to take care of her young daughter. I think uh, once she became involved with him, they became involved in a circumstance that just snowballed out of control. People wonder, someone like Natalie, who seems so normal, how she can fall so fast and so hard for a guy wearing an ankle bracelet. The impact that Jarrell Henry had on Natalie Johnson's life was so severe. She went from a caring, loving person and loving mother to a monster. Natalie just kind of surrendered herself for her man, and now she's suffering the consequences.
Nó vẫn đứng ở đấy nó không ra Ôi giời ơi 